So each star occupies this volume. So the distance between neighboring stars is, uh, between you and your nearest neighbor is typically the size of the system divided by the one third power of the number of particles. In n on units, the speeds are typically one, and so the time step is of order n to the minus one third, typically. Now each time step, as I've just said, takes of order n operations, there are n particles per advance, and so it turns out that the computational effort for n on time unit is around about n to the 7 thirds, and um, this is a comparison of the time taken to go up to time 10 in n on units as a function of um, the logarithm of n. This is 10,000 here, this is 10 particles here, and as long as the number of particles is about around about 100, you're very, very close to this uh, uh, n to the seventh such as n is here. Now for the, I mean, that, <coughs> that dependence is rather severe. It means that if you want to uh, double the number of particles, just to go up to 10 uh, uh, n-on units, you have to uh, increase the computational effort by more than a factor of four. And so for that reason, although computers typically got faster by a factor of two in about 18 months or so, every 18 months or so, the number of particles which you've been able to include in advanced star cluster simulations, that is ones which are not just running for 10 n on units, but enough uh, time in order to um, uh, reach core collapse, say. That number has increased very, very slowly. Uh, it started in 1960 with Sebastian von Werner, who did 16 body simulations, and it gradually increased by a combination of software and hardware improvements um, up until the present day. This is a bit of a cheat here, putting my dot here for 500,000 uh, particles at 2011. There is one figure in one paper from such a simulation uh, that I, I'm still in the process of writing up the results of that simulation, and so I've given myself a green circle, more or less, at the present day, uh, to indicate this in the score. Um, I think this is uh, uh, Hurley and Shara, rather than Hurley and Sipa. It should be Hurley and Sipa. No, it's Sipa and Hurley. Sipa and Hurley, I beg. Uh, <laughs> so you need a dot, actually, probably you need a dot to stop here somewhere. Yeah, it's slightly higher. Just slightly higher. Slightly later? Huh? 2012? Uh, yeah, it doesn't. Okay. I'll, I'll correct this. <laughs> and I think I'll take this in Paris. Of course, every author who gives you a picture like this can show you a version in which his own simulation turned out to be at the top. I was astonished to see one from Simon Portuguese spark a few months ago and Simon was at the top. Anyway, this shows you how slow has been the process, uh, pro progress in doing advanced envoy simulations. I mean, the, 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 the byword is basically a decade per decade. A decade meaning a factor of 10 in the number of particles per 10 years uh, in the net sense of decade. So now we're at the point where one can just do something like half a million particles. Now that sounds good for star clusters. But you know, there's 40 million tuck out there, or down there somewhere, which has got 2 million particles. Then we're going to be able to do 40 million tuck. And simply being able to do half a million particles uh, is not enough. Are there any sheets with triples? Or is it Pardon? Are there sheets with triples? Yeah, by, by reason triples is still revolutionary. It's gradually been created. There's no cheats with the honest. No? Cheats. And honestly, all the triples. No, you don't integrate it. You don't grind around every single order of all the triples. You know. It's the run of the chart and just leave them alone until you want to break them up. So uh, we probably don't do cosine in the meantime. So it's not. What's the typical binary fraction? Well, uh, probably zero for a long time because nobody thought there were any boundaries until about uh, 1970, 1980, I think. Uh, and for the globular cluster, the simulations typically 10%, which is fine for public clusters now. Do the dynamics and statistics of the cluster change that much between 100,000 to 200,000 from 10,000 particles? 
I'll, I'll, I'll mention this issue of scaling the problem. I mean, that would be the obvious answer in some ways to try and mimic 2 million stars with 2,000 or 20,000 and somehow scale up the results. But it, it works up to that point. Maybe with the new version of anybody sex class class, it is possible to do one thing in time. Well, with any version of any code, it's possible to do it as well as possible. So <laughs> this asset can split the asset in the middle of so the update. Hang it, does it hang oh. out in the What? To what? I mean, um, now the capacity of this code is much larger than this code. Yeah, the capacity is a lot much larger, but it's not being done. It's being done. No, I don't, well, how, how can it have been done? It's, um, now we can easily simulate one million particles in that code. Now, how long did it take? Uh, you mean the com computational time? Or? Yes, for, for a Hubble time. Uh, no, that, that would take you. I should say that this was uh, published and unpublished runs completed. I'll mention uh, anybody six plus plus in this one. Real quick, it's not for it. So that is a question. Is it like six month runs? Is that typical in this field? Or? Um, no, I would say typical runs are uh, fortnight or something like that. Kind of thing. But the most ambitious runs are much more than six months. Okay. <coughs> Um, three bottlenecks. I think I've, I've kind, of, kind of covered this. I already said that uh, choosing the next particle could be um, accelerated. Um, extrapolating the particles could be accelerated. And it's still the main residual bottleneck is the cooperation for uh, acceleration. Now, um, as I've said, the, the, the improvement in the ability of these codes has increased for two reasons. One is software and one is hardware. And this is one of the software developments. It's actually uh, a very old one by now. Uh, but it's the kind of thing which uh, is in, implemented in n 6 and does allow you to um, uh, advance uh, these simulations a good deal faster by, say, a factor of 10 than otherwise would be the case. But I'll pass on from that because this is relatively old hat. But many people here might wonder why I'm still doing direct summation uh, calculations in this field when there are much faster ways of calculating gravitational accelerations which are in use in cosmological simulations, for example, or galaxy simulations. And the fundamental reason is that uh, these fast methods, tree codes and grid codes and so on, don't really converge, conserve energy accurately enough. To some extent, this is, this is a sort of community um, uh, informal agreement. Um, but it's certainly true that it, uh, energy conservation is something you have to worry about seriously if you were to try and do core collapse, say, with uh, a tree code. I, I don't understand. You have a tree code which you know, have as many uh, branches Yes, well then you might as well try and do an end point. But this case goes N on N. Uh, yeah, but what's the factor in front of the end point? So that's the question. I'd say I think that probably exists. You don't think even a million is computable? I don't. I mean, the energy conservation is an issue uh, unless you make that opening angle that uh, tiny enough, and then you're essentially doing an end point before. And you have to do close interaction that way. Sure, you have to do close interaction separate right? Yeah. So, well, maybe there's some kind of hybrid method. It just seems like when N goes to so large, the tree code will come in again. Well, then it comes back to that question, which uh, I forget who it was who was asked, who was, who was making the point. Oh, in fact, it was uh, Jerry Sell's project, I think, actually, which was the question how collisionless are tree codes? Now, uh, if one was using a tree code one, you'd have to rely on it to be, to, to be as good at doing two-body relaxation as the vaccination code uh, is. And that's a different way of asking the same question, actually. You know, how collision is, or how, and my, my question would be, how collisional is a tree code? And with the, the experience that I've had of trying to do, say, two-component core collapse with a tree code, 
And I, I did a comparison with John Vinsky here uh, a few years ago. Um, it, but it convinced me that there's a lot to take care of if you're trying to, uh, if you've got stars of different masses, for example, and you wanted to faithfully model the two body relaxation between those or the tree core. Okay, so um, this is uh, the N body 6 plus plus, which was mentioned uh, by Max uh, a minute or two ago. Um, uh, you can, of course, uh, accelerate the force calculation by um, our farming art, the force calculation on different particles, different processors, for example, and uh, the different ways in which that uh, parallelization can be carried out. But there's a, a, a cord which is under intensive development just now uh, from Ryan Spurzen and his students uh, called NBody 6, which has uh, been recently upgraded. <coughs> and I think one should be on the lookout for still larger accomplished public simulations uh, from the students uh, in Beijing. Now, uh, with, in the absence of a, a big uh, parallel computer and lots of uh, cores and so on, actually, the, the poor man's way of approaching this is uh, with graphic programming processing units. Uh, this is not a graphics processing unit. This is the box containing the graphics processing unit. And um, it, 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 it looks a little bit lurid, but in fact, there is a sort of astronomical element in here. <laughs> there's, uh, there's this planet up, 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 up in the sky. So. That's how I excused myself and then we came into my office and found this really box on my desk. So these things, as you know, they're, they're very, very cheap. They, they cost of the order of 200 uh, euros or so. And they speed up your uh, standard um, uh, box PC with by about a factor of 100 or so uh, in practice in this game. And so I've given here another little uh, potted how-to on uh, constructing the GPU-enabled version of NBody 6, which is the kind of workforce for anybody who's doing uh, research in this area <coughs> at the present moment. So since this will be up in the red and new course, <coughs> I'll, uh, I'll just leave it uh, for explanation. Here's NBody, uh, I was about to say, here's NBody 6. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair our set, as he was uh, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> Mr. N body six. Uh, this is Fair Arcet as he was uh, just last month at the meeting in uh, Germany. Uh, he's approaching his 80th birthday, which is sometime this month, I think. Um, and uh, this diagram here just indicates from uh, a description paper of N body six GPU the advantages you obtain. So without the GPU, the time taken for doing a certain number of time units with uh, so many particles, this is 10,000, this is 100,000, is up here, and you get more or less, uh, uh, well, slightly less than two orders of magnitude with the GPU, which is this curve here, for 10,000 particles, but by the time you go to uh, 100,000 particles, you're getting a root factor of uh, 100. And I remember the delight with which I first measured the plot rate that I was getting from a GPU uh, on some large endpoint of simulation that came out to be 1.1 teraflop or something like that. And I've never seen this number in companies before. Uh, but certainly, uh, the, 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 the scale of uh, adapting endpoint 6 to the GPU is um, in as well. So in the last um, uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so, what I want to do is to show you how N body 6 has been adapted to or applied to do what uh, these lectures are about, which is uh, handle the dynamical evolution of uh, global star clusters. And it's, it's, it's not just the dynamics in N body 6 which makes it appropriate, it includes treatments of stellar evolution, uh, parameterized stellar evolution for various metallicities, which is important for the global clusters, obviously, because uh, we have a range of metallicities. Uh, it includes uh, modeling of the effects of external forces, gravitational acceleration due to the galaxy. You can put the um, cluster on a normal orbit around the galaxy if you want. Um, and it includes treatments of collisions, 
alternative uh, treatment of collision is that it's best that one can do without spending a lot of time on them. And, and there are thousands of collisions between stars in the uh, uh, entire evolution of typical galactic model clusters. Now, so far, only two galactic model clusters have had their entire dynamical history model and published. And both are due to um, uh, Akram Sami Samusi and uh, her collaborators uh, working in the bond. Uh, I think uh, Andreas is uh, one of the collaborators on at least one of these papers. Uh, and uh, an example is this uh, uh, Goblin star cluster, Kalamar 14, which is down here. <coughs> It's a, it, so not this object here, not this object here, but the, the scattering of stars in, in the background. It's clear that this uh, cluster is a fairly sparse, poor cluster, which is what makes it amenable to uh, modeling in a relatively uh, short time. So the initial number of particles is in the range of 70, 70 to 100,000, which is typical for uh, decent sized end body simulations these days. It's also got an initial um, half match radius, which is quite large by the standards of globular clusters. That means the time scales are very, very long, and therefore their evolution can be computed in a relatively short uh, space of time. And that space of time is around about a month if you include binaries, and without binaries, it takes just a few days. So this is a uh, powerful key. That's yeah. Yeah. Why is this 10% assumed the not? Why is this? Why is ten percent partial for binaries in the scheme for global clusters? Well, that's the clusters when they were born. I don't know. But if you if you try and put uh, hundred percent binaries in a global cluster model, you wear yourself down to uh, something around about half of your initial binary population. But we can see and count and, and, and figure out the binary fraction in the global clusters simply from photometric offset binaries in the color magnitude data. And 10% uh, is uh, typical, and there are some clusters where it's two is two percent. So as the cluster are going to form, why not that binary? Uh, there is many binary stars that you have in the open clusters. For example, massive stars, we expect a very large, and we won't see them today anyway, so. Yeah. That's, 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 that's. <coughs> so it takes it, it takes about a day then to do Paul 14. How long would it take to do my favorite uh, global star cluster M4? By the way, I'm very keen on seeing M4. I think we should have a practical session uh, at the telescope uh, or with uh, Pierre Mocheras uh, in the next uh, few weeks. It's very, very well placed in the south, uh, to be seen from uh, Toronto, much better than from Edinburgh. Um, and uh, you can very, very easily find it with a pair of if you can find Antares, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky, and just offset from that, between Antares and Sigma, Scorpionis is uh, a six magnitude uh, blur called M4. And it would be very nice if you could all see this. Yeah. Let me just get a comment on that. So tomorrow night, tomorrow night's banquet, and then after the banquet, the telescopes upstairs going to be open at 10 p.m. Oh. Then everybody can come in. It's going to be a public tour, so it's not to be here for the school, but anybody in Toronto can come in and use yes. the telescope. Did they take requests? They made requests. <laughs> So if there's possibly more, some returns and requests and four, I'm sure they're going to be. So just for count, that's fine. But yeah, it just said it's already open, it's not in my area. And it's light, it's cancer, it's dark, it's not good. So anybody can come in. It doesn't get dark till about 10. Oh. Exactly. That's why it's fine. At least it gets dark. <laughs> you just have to go to the 15th floor. What? You just have to go to the 15th floor, which is yeah. a challenge. What? <laughs> Take the elevator to the 14. You walk to the south end of the building, go up those stairs. Um, yeah. Not the stairs in this site, that's all. Okay, so if it takes uh, a few days to do PAL 14, how long does it take to uh, simulate M4? And what one's going to do is to, is to use this uh, approximate scaling 
uh, relation which I uh, mentioned already in terms of the number of particles. This is uh, a sort of uh, uh, computational effort for crossing time. The crossing time depends on the size, um, roughly in this way, and on the particle number. And so basically, for, for star clusters of all the same age, the computing time varies in the way which you can predict. A very, very steep uh, power of the, the particle number, almost the cube, and then um, for a small star cluster, it takes even longer. And, uh, the M4 is a, is a cluster which I've modeled with uh, MIREC uh, using Monte Carlo techniques uh, some time ago. And so I have what I think is a fairly good stab at the initial conditions for uh, M4. So 500,000 rather than 100,000 for PAL 14, and an initial half mass radius, which will be strikingly probably shockingly small, um, but anyway, by a factor of at least 20 smaller than uh, PAL 14. So both of these are bad factors. And that would scale up the effort by a factor of 20,000 roughly and it would take about 100 years. Um, for a long time, I was waiting for somebody with a big computer to do something like M4. And then I waited and waited, and I got fed up with it waiting. And I thought, well, hang on, I'm just going to do it myself, even if it does take 100 years. <laughs> so I started with this uh, equipment here on the 30th of October 2010. And it was just kind of entry-level equipment with four GPUs sitting in this, uh, in, in this box. I only used two of them because it's a kind of, um, not exactly a public access uh, uh, box, but uh, I have to share it uh, from time to time. And actually, the simulation finished last summer, after only three years. I knew it was going to speed up, because after all, the star cluster loses mass and particles as time goes on. It's get, it gets bigger. So you know all of the factors which make it a hard job gradually work in your favor. And um, yeah, so it, so it finished much sooner than uh, you might think. This, this, this attracted my attention so much that I even started talking to my wife about this simulation. And I remember I came home after about six months, and I could see that it speeded up a lot. And I said to her over breakfast once, I said, you know that simulation about N4 I told you about? Well, I think it may be finished in about two years. And quick in the flash, she said back to me, well, there's a good chance you'll still be alive. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> Wives are good for that kind of thing. <laughs> so, and here's uh, what it said. Uh, in summary, obviously it tells you the positions of all the stars all the time, but just in summary, this is the kind of thing one likes to know. In my n body simulation, so this is up to uh, 12 billion years, which I guess is roughly the age of N4. I mean, I, I, I did run the calculations of exhaustion, but it just took a few more days to get up to its, its, its end point. So this is the total mass in uh, solar masses, which started off in the scale of 50,000 solar masses. The green curve is where it is at the present day. The red curve is uh, where the uh, Monte Carlo code said it should be uh, at the present day. So this, this model, I think, is just a little bit on the massive side. This is Emax doing the same job in about a tenth of a second, uh, probably evolving just a bit too fast. But uh, I don't suppose this market is going to be that. Um, and the reason it goes a bit too fast is that it's expanding really quite enough, I don't think. So here is the half mass radius as a function of time. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so it just expands by stellar evolution of the action of the black holes. Then it meets the time of radius. I, I, I went into the interpretation of this curve just uh, yesterday. So this is N body, this is uh, Monte Carlo, and this is in that. So these match pretty well with the curve? Well, uh, this, this one I know matches pretty well. I think the, the, the N body model is just a bit bright. Uh, being a bit massive. It's got the right mass to light ratio and so on, but it's a little bit on the right side. So it's sort of like after two or less? Uh, less than five or two, yeah. Now there's a problem actually, you see. If you can do an, uh, an n body simulation of N4, but it takes you two and a half years, what do you do if you find out the answer wasn't the right one? Mm -hmm. Go 
go back and buy a new GPU that's faster than a year and a half. Yeah, or else you have a cluster of GPUs and you try out different initial conditions somewhere else. Probably the smart thing to do, but I don't have that kind of equipment. Yeah, so that's the so in summary, here is the challenge of the Milky Way globular clusters. This is another version of the plot which I gave you uh, for the Monte Carlo code. So each cross here represents our galactic uh, globular cluster, plotted its half mass relaxation time and its absolute visual magnitude. And here the contours are again separated by factors of 10. And uh, uh, rather stupidly, unfortunately, I normalized this scaling at half of 14, which I knew took a few days. Uh, and my estimate for M4 is 300 years here. So it's actually around about three years rather than 300 years. So clearly, the scaling is a bit deficient. And part of the reason for that, actually, is the scaling assumed that you were being dominated by the force conflict. And the GPUs for half the time, that's not true, actually. It's all the other things that you have to do, primary stars, which take up a lot of, a lot of effort. And the scaling of course, is quite different. But it's still, you know, the, the, the ordering here is about right. And so if it takes you two or three years to do M4, 47 tuck is still going to take you about 100 years, even taking into account all the uh, accelerations, which ones can now, um, Pascal mentioned um, uh, uh, a while ago, you know, I, I think this was what under the, the question, if you're trying to model uh, a big star cluster like Forest and Top with 2 million stars, why don't you try and do it with a scaled up version of a small end body simulation? And up to a point, you can do that. So suppose we want to simulate a cluster with n stars using a model with n star stars. And the n stars are going to be very much less than the number of stars in the system. Now the basic principle you want to uh, build into such a situation is that all the important physical processes scale in an understood way with the particle number. Now, uh, there's nothing you can do about stellar evolution, which definitely is important in these simulations. So in some senses, uh, that fixes uh, your scaling. But there is something else one can do if you also want to get the two-body relaxation right. Now, the two-body relaxation time scales like uh, Lyman Spitzer's formula here for the half-mass relaxation time. So you want to make sure that your model relaxes at the same rate as the uh, actual star cluster itself. And that means that the number of stars in your model and the radius of your model should be equal to the same uh, combination of factors for the actual star cluster. Now, what you're forcing is n star here to be much less than this n. And that means that you have to model uh, your big star cluster with a model whose uh, space radius, Rh, is actually larger to compensate for the smaller particle number. Because a given half mass relaxation time can be achieved a smaller particle number only if you have a more distended uh, cluster. So that's the way that one has to do it. You have to model uh, a rich star cluster with a model which has got a smaller number of stars but with a larger radius. And that, that means you can get the two-body relaxation and the stellar evolution right simultaneously. But there are limitations to it. You can't scale in such a way that the rate of collisions is right, the behavior of the binary is right, because that depends on the same major axes. You can't get the escape rate right, because that depends on a, on a it doesn't depend on the relaxation time. If you get that right, you don't get the escape rate right. And um, so one does have to do this kind of scaling with a great deal of care. Um, but nevertheless, it's an approach which one can uh, try to use. And in fact, you can also use it with the Monte Carlo code. And when Mirek and I were studying on the Centauri, we did that with uh, very much scaled down Monte Carlo models. This was the early attempt. And here was the surface brightness of Omega Sen matched by the Monte Carlo model. 
here's the uh, mass function, the local mass function in two different locations in the cluster matched by the Monte Carlo model. And here is the velocity dispersion as a function of radius. This is the line of sight velocity dispersion. Here is the Monte Carlo model, that uh, dashed line. And here are the data points from the observations. And we notice, like everybody does, you can't quite get to the central velocity dispersion along the same um, one of these models. Here's a scaled n body model of the uh, omega sen from uh, these authors, much more recent, uh, using a somewhat larger number of uh, particles for the model, scaling up to around about 6 million stars, which is roughly the current population of omega sen. Here's the model, the black point. Uh, here are the observations, the red points. And again, one can't get up to the um, observed velocity dispersion, which would get us on to the next question of intermediate mass black holes. But as I've hinted, um, one of the main difficulties you're faced with in modeling a specific star cluster, like then for a positive type of selecting the right initial conditions. And I don't know any way of doing that without some very, very fast method of doing the, of doing the dynamical evolution. So I've always done this so far with a Monte Carlo code which in scaled versions might take an hour or something like that to do the entire evolution. Um, or you could use Emacs, hopefully, um, to, to, do, to do this kind of job very, very quickly. Um, but it's, I, I suppose the basic message is that it's not enough just to be able to do one simulation. You've really got to do 50 or 100 to match, to, to understand how to match a specific um, star plot. So it's quite a chat challenge. I'm going to pass on this very, very quickly and pass to my last slide, which is just a roundup of these three lectures. Uh, thank you very much for having the patience to sit through them. But uh, the first one talked about uh, snapshot modeling, which is not concerned with dynamic evolution. Uh, it's, a, it's a growing industry because of the observational input from things like Gaia, I hope. Um, but it still needs more elaborate uh, theoretical work. Uh, not just King models, but it also needs rotation, it needs mass segregation, it needs tides, it needs anisotropy, potential escapers. Quite a few of the topics which are um, uh, embedded in the projects which uh, I've uh, listed. And then when, when it goes on to the dynamical evolution, uh, direct end body modeling is still a serious computational challenge for the big rich star clusters which uh, uh, a lot of people observe and understand are interested in. Monte Carlo modeling is the alternative of choice. It's realistic for all of the um, star clusters to uh, use that uh, method and it's been thoroughly uh, developed and brought up to date. And I guess the point of yesterday's lecture uh, on the background theory was that it's amazing that the results of these very elaborate calculations can be qualitatively understood on the basis of simple arguments and I hope you find that the gravitational theory of uh, n body systems was also interesting. So thank you very much for your Thank you. I had some questions during the uh, additional questions. So there are blocks of n and functions of time. There's a sort of light in the end of the tunnel, which is the age of the universe, right? At some point, n becomes so large essentially collision is for the duration yeah, of that's true. Yeah, that's true. So how far do you think we're away from that point? Ten years? Ten years? Well I guess um, then you probably want to start thinking of simpler ways of doing the calculation rather than anybody. Um, but suppose you had a dwarf galaxy, which is the kind of thing that one's heading for. What would be the dynamical tool of choice for studying the evolution of the dwarf would, would one want to use a, a, a tree code? Then? Because they're, they are they relaxed? Then there's gas. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they, they have ongoing star formation in my heart. And they're dark matter. Yeah. 
So maybe it, maybe it turns into a different physical regime rather than being a sort of end point of, of history. Question. Did anyone actually do star formation in anybody? No. no. I don't think so. I think this is maybe under development uh, to try and understand the second generation of That's a young person. People do use star formation now in a lot of these small mm -hmm. you know, boxes. Well, people yeah. have gaps to two that's the three colors. But you can do it in small boxes. And there are fairly realistic attempts to now people are making hundreds to thousands of stars. Yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes the end body becomes a pretty big penalty actually. Because people yeah. are doing direct end body in some of these. Uh -huh. So I was doing this recently. We turned off the end body because it was just taking forever. Right. We started using tree code and forget about it. But it would be good to, you know, we're not using GPUs, but if you could hand that off to GPU. But people are just starting to do this now. If, if. And of a thousand or ten thousand. Right. So if there's a point at which you can um, assume that the star formation is finished, and then you have a gas distribution and then, you know, you get cores or, or actual stars or something like that, and you think, you might think of turning it over to anus. And uh, I think a muse would actually allow you to, in fact, this has already been done with the muse. It allows you to um, model the effective uh, radiative feedback from the stars onto the gas and to model the, the expansion of the gas. So this, this might be a way. doing ray tracing. I don't think it's that elaborate at the moment, actually. No. So, so this is right now the name of the game if you don't understand the star formation. It's effects of radiative both radiation pressure directly and also heating and low mass flow. Right. right. And the heating has a lot to do with people claim that the IMF. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, that's sort of a big country. But yeah, this is the beginning to be the, the case that mm -hmm. the fields are starting to merge. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. So I I mean maybe the maybe the thing to do is you can be for the suggested problem if you build in on the cores, which I presume you start in the in the investigation in the gas, and you start it into a muse. I would have thought of these. Sorry. I would have thought these are kind of two different scale type of problem. You can actually focus on one type of scale with the star formation, and then the gas dynamics is overwhelmingly important. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you can handle this other aspect. Um, after most of the stock formation is all done, then uh, gas becomes a trace. No, I don't think, I think there is a point, it's a very important point, because in fact the star is a um, certain it's called the star formation. So yeah. you have to use the stars and their positions to decide how. I understand, but that's, a, that's part of the problem you could do separately from the part of the problem that, you know, looking at the long term effort. Yes, of yeah, clusters, I agree. Right? Yeah. And where the, uh, there, there's sort of, uh, even if you want to do gas, uh, to look at the sort of like second generation, sure, and, yeah. and, sure. and there it's not so dominant. Yeah, I'm looking at the other end of things. Yeah, earlier on. When, when the end body is starting to become a yard, and it's not being treated well at the moment. Right. Okay. And, and I think it might actually. Come go back to what you mentioned yesterday. You were saying potentially the suggestion that the world has to be much more compact in the past when the first born and then relaxed within the cluster. So if that's true and you want to be correct in your condition, you will have to spend ninety nine percent of all the computing time for that every episode. Yeah. That was what made this calculation so long. Right. So how do you know you're getting your condition right after starting as an actual cell? But it wasn't an RPA size because it was the one that was picked by the Monte Carlo simulation. I, mean, I, I, I mentioned that there was a, a, an earlier Monte Carlo investigation in which we studied hundreds of Monte Carlo where it sets of initial conditions with the Monte Carlo code. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the best fit that we had after the band of evolution with the surface brightness profile, the normal function, uh, everything that we knew about. So you used Monte Carlo to do the early part? No, no, to no. decide what initial conditions should be. But if initial conditions ten times smaller, that's right. If the customer is ten times smaller than it is today, 
No, that was exactly what I was confusing. It started a long time. I see. You started a custody in Taiwan. Exactly. Yeah, but the thing about that was you can throw So which uh, figure was this? The one with the, the 10 body curve on it? Uh, as a function of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 How about the initial growth there? Was most of that stellar evolution or no? No, I, I, I used to think this was stellar evolution, but it's not. never been anything like that. That's what I thought. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. Mark will probably fill me a bit more in this, actually. I mean, if you just thought of uh, stellar evolution as losing somewhere like 20 or 70 percent of the mass, exactly. yeah, 20 or 70 percent expansion. But yeah. what, of course, has happened is that the stars lose all that mass of something at the bottom. And so the deep in the bottom of the potential well, and the Newton's mass actually it heats up much more the mass. So it than is than evolution, but coupled with the sort of boost of having them all down at the bottom yeah. of the well. But plus, plus, you've got the central core and stellar mass back hole. And they're kicking stars. A few hundred yards. Uh, we're kicking each other up. Yeah, yeah. And that by itself would be enough actually to power this expansion. But if, if, if Enon was right, actually, um, if Enon's principle was right, then, um, in some sense, it's not as if you pile two of these uh, energy generation mechanisms together and you get twice as fast an expansion. I, I haven't actually checked this, but to see whether this expansion is simply the expansion you predict by relaxation, in which case this uh, NON argument of uh, producing enough energy to match that energy flux uh, kicks in. I'm afraid that this is, in fact, uh, um, too fast. And it, it's but you have two mechanisms now. You've got this pumping energy. You also are physically kicking stars out of the center. Well, these are the same. These are, these are different windows into the same path of uh, <coughs> uh, I think yeah. one way of saying is if you take out the stellar evolution process, you still get that expansion by some other mechanism. Mm -hmm. You will get more ejections, more binary encounters. Is that actually what you think about? I'd have to do another yeah. simulation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Wait, you can theory. You can theory. As opposed to just no, no, I, I was relying on Mark's uh, guidance in this. But I think he studied this. Uh, it's a difficult uh, experiment to do because the stellar motion changes also the, the shape of the stellar mass motion, right? right? So you cannot actually do this experiment literally if you cannot take the change mass function without changing the mass. One way, yes. Yes, that's the true. Model, well, well, the reason stellar motion, the reason I was stuck by this because Right? You put in, I don't know, saltpeter ion or something? Uh, perfect. Right. Perfect. So, so if you calculate the, the surface density of this thing at the beginning, it's about 100 grams per square second, which is a very high surface density. And it's uh, normally gas pools in the far infrared by line emission from C plus or from C or like that. But this thing will be optically thick, up to a millimeter weight. So all those coolant, coolants are shut off. So when this thing forms, that's how you get gas in there, that you can't get rid of that energy as efficiently. So it would be much hotter yeah. in this cluster than in you know, the things that you know, uh -huh. The temperature could be up to several hundred or even a thousand degrees Kelvin. Now that may affect the IMF. Uh -huh. not. Uh -huh. But you might suspect it would. What do we see in superclusters today? We see these about. clusters that are not that, this half a parsec is not crazy. You don't see <coughs> clusters that are of that size and that mass. So it's not nuts to think that it's half a parsec. But you actually see clusters like that. They are optically thick. There's no indication that the IFF is the first thing you can't measure. That's very interesting. I mean, I've never thought. I, I've got never realism about the initial conditions. Well, you might want to start taking your simulations realistically. I think they're probably very close to right. I mean, uh, like as I say, observations see clusters today of that mass and that radius. Uh, and, uh, and then the fact that you get an answer within a factor of two at the end makes you think, well, it's doing something right. Yeah, but if, if you simply wanted the factor of two here, actually, you could probably start with a whole range of the That I could believe. So that would be interesting, like you say, sort of painful yeah. and expensive, but it would be worth well, I think you could probably explore <laughs> that quickly. Isn't that exactly like that? In fact, that's been but the blue one was, you said it was in that, right? 
This is email. Okay. And which that would be a little bit more time. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want to embarrass uh, Mark by showing this picture. I'm curious about the problem that you choose. Yes, I, I, I'd like to discuss the simple process. I have a simple process. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's 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 and um, as far as I remember, my initial conditions were kind of within her, you know, her mindset. Uh, yeah, just uh, to defend Paul and on this one a little bit, because this cluster is quite close to its final uh, stage of dissolution, it's very sensitive if yeah. you're off a little bit, because if our size would be 10% uh, larger and the rate mass temperature is larger, it may get very close. Yeah. I mean, it's not terrible, it's, it's two yeah. versus three. These are the hardest ones. I think mean, we are really, you know, most off in these last stages of evolution. Yeah, because I think I tried the index model for the model I did, which is further away from the galactic center, and you won't get that. Because it dies, it's less close to the center. Yeah. But I remember. Well, about this three simulation, which has the best energy conservation. Ah, yeah, yes. But we can still, we should still use the temporary result as the standard result. No, I, I, there, there are some flaws in the end calculation which I've uh, hidden from you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, 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 no, I wouldn't consider that the situation is I would judicially judicial, uh, look at the results from both uh, the Monte Carlo and the end situation. Understand one has its own limitations, yeah. um, I'm not. To, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to argue intelligently about what's basically wrong. I, I have a little problem with my attempt because uh, regarding your question, the, um, oh, MBODY 6 plus plus instead of MBODY 6 is integrated into a muse, and one can take the advantage of the, the muse I of the CLT to generate. Uh, without it. And also the amuse uh, the MB6 plus plus code itself as the HDF5 output implemented. So um, now one doesn't have to uh, read the com.3 file manually. Mm -hmm. This is a tricky file. But uh -huh. if you use MB uh, use the MB6 plus plus you can just directly read the native output of HDF5 format. And this format is a standard High performance scientific computing format, which is supported by many data analysis packages or problem layers. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you.